and we should be going. Uh, first of all, a uh, very warm welcome to you, Paul Larsen. Actually, that could be a Danish name. How do you pronounce it in English? Larsen, you're you're quite correct, Lars. Um, I I'm my blood is Danish. I just happened to be born in Canada with Danish parents. Ah, so that's the way around. Yeah. Yes. Great, and uh, this is a series of talks that I'd call Science and Practice, which is, so to say, an offspring from the, the book where you wrote a chapter, I also did uh, myself, uh, and you specifically on the HIT training, the high-intensity interval training, which you could say could cover a broad spectrum of training, but today we will uh, mainly focus on uh, the, the short uh, interval formats that you repeat with short breaks in between in order to create a high intense, you could say it, it will of course be an aerobic because you can have a high cardiovascular strain, but of course will it will be with some superimposed uh, uh, anaerobic contribution and also con uh, contribution from your myoglobin, uh, your, your myoglobin stalls and, uh, and also that you can get it of a much higher uh, uh, work output. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I Absolutely. Absolutely, Lars, for sure. Um, this is a real topic of passion to me is really high intensity interval training and um, and comparing the various different ones. Maybe I'll just start with this slide here, Lars, and just yeah. uh, just this is this is from um, Martin Bescheid and myself. Um, science and application of high intensity interval training. And then it, there's a couple of publications that the the listener can get um, in sports medicine. Um, but then as we also have uh, our textbook as well that we really kind of put all of those those publications into. And then of course in Indigo's book as well that you just mentioned science and practice that we both authors in in, in chapters there it, there's there's work in there. But it's similar stuff. Um, you I'll can try see to here... link to uh, to the to the paper so people can find them uh through the, the, the different channels in, in the common field so people can find those. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you, Lars. Um, so yeah, so the, just in terms of the key variables and that will Lars and I will speak on to today as well, we're going to look at the intensity and the duration of the work interval, right, of your hit session, and then the intensity and the duration of the recovery interval. Those are the main two characteristics. Of course, you can have lots of different series you can repeat these in sort of, you know, series of, of, uh, of, of bouts of repetitions. You can have different uh, intensities and durations between those series. Um, and then, you know, there's lots of different variables that you need to kind of consider, such as the total, the total amount of work or, or volume that's done in there as well. But we're going to focus mostly on the, the work and the recovery interval. We'll use cycling as our predominant um, modality. We can change the modality as well, of course. Yeah. Um, but Lars wanted me to start with really just dis explaining, first of all, the difference between your short interval and your long interval. So let's start with a long interval and how we define that, at least within the context of HIT science, science and application, high intensity interval training is really just looking at um, the long interval, two to five minutes, we classify that as, you know, work. And when we're talking about HIT, don't forget we're above your VT2 uh, lactate, second lactate turn point, you've got to be above that. And specifically, you're sitting sort of around the, um, the power output or running speed that you would get to at the end of an incremental test. Okay, so two to five minutes of work intervals followed by one to four minutes of recovery. And the recovery can be active or passive. Um, and we can, we can go into that a little bit more. Uh, as well. So that is the long interval. Now let's let's move on to the short interval next. So short interval, in contrast, has shorter bouts, of course, of work intervals and short bouts of recovery, right? And they can be anywhere from 10 to 60 seconds um, of work and 10 to 60 seconds of recovery. These are usually done at a, a similar or slightly higher exercise intensity. You can see here it's moved into the 100 to 120 percent of the incremental test uh, value that you would get at the end. So as we often say in hit science, lots of different ways to skin the cat. And Lars and I are going to speak today about 
why you might skin the cat a certain way versus another one. And we'll look at kind of the contrast between the long and the short intervals. Yeah. So any any points on that to start, Lars? I've got I've got one more thing I'm gonna talk about here in a sec, but anything to start on? No, no, but I think it's interesting and I agree that it's it's in 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 this work domain. I mean actually I have a I I trained a guy, he was he's really explosive. So I actually did five seconds on and ten seconds breaks, and he can he can achieve his his view to max in that, and and in terms of power output, then because it's only five seconds on, his output may be in in actually in double on what he would end on in in a set like that, and that was a way that we used it because I mean he was very explosive, but of course less fatigue resistant, and he was quite vulnerable at the end of uh, of cycling races to all of these. Uh, uh, kicks that you have uh, in in the final pride people try to go away so it was actually a way that we tried to mix it up in a specific way that he he could have higher fatigue resistance in those types of efforts so i think that you can mix it up in in as you said you can skin a cat in many ways you can really mix it up in a in in lots of ways uh and that yeah but but i mean that, that like just think of what you said there like just for the listener um, Lars said a really important thing there that you wouldn't intuitively think this cyclist that Lars is training, he's only exercising for five seconds, five seconds only repeatedly with big, big rests between. And Lars just said he's getting towards VO2 max with these high intensities. He's getting big heart rates. Like it's, it's amazing the fact that that can be done because you wouldn't think about it originally, you know, initially that way. You would, you wouldn't think it, it could potentially be no, no. cardiovascular wise. So it's, it's, it's a real. And wow I, I, I don't think that I could get it there myself because I'm not that explosive. So I think that the rest periods, I mean, it was 10 seconds off and then 10, five seconds on again. Uh, but be, it, it, it was probably because he was, he had such a high uh, anaerobic power that he could do it. That's right. So this is kind of the, you now we're kind of hinting in here at the, the leverage and the power of the short interval. Um, and again, my colleague, Martin, uh, Martin Bescheid was the, really the guy that, that explained this to me, but it's actually been known since the fifties or sixties with um, Astrand, I think, and he published a number of papers um, on, on these. So, um, but, but let's, let's, um, let's look at why this actually occurs, this phenomenon that Lars is talking about. Um, here's just kind of a contrast. We've got a, let's just call it a longer interval. This is if you were going to do 60 seconds of that interval on this side. Notice the big oxygen debt that you create when you prolong those intervals out. And you compare that to the short interval here, the 10 seconds or five seconds explosive that, that Lars is, is talking about, not as much uh, oxygen deficit. Why? This little cool protein here called myoglobin, that myoglobin, it's the muscle's hemoglobin. It takes on, its job is to sat fully saturate and get ready for the next explosive boat um, as a human. And it's, you can see here how much myoglobin um, oxygen actually occurs in a short interval relative to a, a, a longer interval. So these longer intervals, you're going to get a much larger anaerobic contribution. Conversely, if you're stopping, like Lars is saying, and then you're, you're allowing that muscle to replenish with myoglobin, it, it doesn't take as much out. So this is kind and of a contrast between the two. And just to specify, now you mean anaerobic, then you mean anaerobic glycolysis because you also have the phosphocreatine, which also would be anaerobic. That's right. Yeah, I'm yeah. talking about the uh, anaerobic glycolytic. Absolutely. Yeah. We've got phosphocreatine contributions down in the bottom here. So yeah, really good point, Lars. So, But actually to yeah. go to uh, one of the things that I would like to discuss with you, because this uh, myoglobin, uh, and as you also said, you can mix it up and you can have the rest periods either active or complete rest. Which do you prefer? Because I always practice these by having the, the off periods like complete rest with the philosopher that you would then have the biggest chance to reload your myoglobin and also your phosphocreatine in order to have that, so to say, as a burst for the next bout. But then I read uh, or reread, uh, and actually I also asked him, Benz, uh, when he do the 13, 15 seconds, they do 
quite uh, an, a high intensity. They do like uh, half of the, the power output in the rests period. How, how do you yeah. see that? I mean, uh, w how do you practice those or do you mix it up? No, I practice it like you, uh, Lars. Um, and for this exact mechanistic reason, sitting right in front of all of us. And that's the fact that you can, um, the, in, the emphasis should really be on the engagement of the larger fast twitch muscle fibers, your big fibers. Those are what you want to engage. Yeah. And to your point, you're, you're blunting your ability to do that because you're creating in that recovery period, if you're active, you're creating, you're not allowing this oxygen deficit to go away. So you should be as passive as you possibly can in the recovery period. Generally speaking, you know, lots of different contexts might be different, but in general, the if you wanna emphasize the uh, development of your higher power outputs, which I think we all do, you want that myoglobin to be resaturated with oxygen so that you can fire again um, with a mix of, of uh, energy systems on the on the next boat. So um, yeah, my, when I'm when we're training, uh, and you'll I'll, I'll show you some examples coming up here on how on some sessions from some of my athletes. But um, yeah, this is this is how I, I program just exactly like you, Lars. I say just yeah, nice and easy um, on the on the recovery boats. Um, you know, and, and again, Steven Seiler says, you know, he's, uh, you know, if you're in, even in long intervals, uh, two minutes of walking, um, it, from, for the, for the runner that's, that is doing these, uh, these efforts, right. And his data shows, shows that too, but it's the same here for our, our cyclists. Go but of course easy. it's a little, in terms of the philosophy, what do you want to do in order to maximize the stimuli? Is it to create a larger flux? And that's how I see it because you get, so to say, the curse, you can use your myoglobin uh, stores to create an increased, and also in terms of you just use external power as, as the load, but in terms of understanding the physiology, you create a larger flux uh, through the energy flux through those fibers. On the other hand, if you don't allow the breaks, or if you do something in the breaks, which was bent takers, then of course you will also, then you might create a bigger metabolic disturbance in the muscles so it's a matter of what do you think will create the uh, the the adaptation to the stimuli it's clearly if you're not allowing this to to re then you can't do the same work in this in the next interval or eventually it will be lower yeah uh, so i think like you lars and i think always very mechanistically from my past but i also think like a and then you know i think like a coach too but from my mechanistic past, I tend to um, look at the muscle signaling um, uh, molecules such as AMPK. Um, and AMPK is definitely targeted as a signal, muscle signal in the larger high intensity fibers. And of course, AMPK signals for PGC1 alpha, which is going to proliferate a lot of our mitochondrial density, at least there's, at least that's what I believe. I think the, the majority of our, of the, of the data supports that as, as a potential um, hypothesis. And I want lots of mitochondria in my larger fatigue resist, or my larger um, uh, type two muscle fibers or around yeah. that, that marker. And if they are, they're going to, you know, they can just, they can continue to contract uh, at a higher, power output and be more fatigue resistant. So that's the, and if, if I can continue to dig into those um, through this mechanism right here, yeah. then, then, then that's, that's what um, I, I feel is that's, I feel that's why we see a better result. And I'll, I'll show you some in further slides down, I'll show you evidence for the superiority of the short interval over the long interval. Yeah, but it's still also a matter of when you utilize the short intervals, whether the brakes should have s some activity. I mean, as long as you go, I, I mean, you should probably be in quite low intensity in order for this to allow. It's clear that if you're running or if you do, let's say, 50 watts or something which is very low intensity, you will probably get uh, this uh, uh, reloading of the myoglobin. But my philosophy would always be to create the biggest difference. Uh, also, because I utilize this type of training to uh, to be some 
thing where the, the athletes get a very different stimuli than if they do. And then when I do longer intervals, then it's 10 minutes or eight minutes or 15 minutes continues for the, for the cyclists. And then to have something which is very different in terms of power output, but also in terms of, uh, of uh, muscle recruitment. And I mean, from the basic animal principle, the, the larger the difference, you would think that the more you would be able to hit the 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 larger motor uh, units, and then as you said, the the type two uh, uh, fibers. Yeah, I I agree. So fifty watts, perfect. Yeah. Um, but I think what, uh, not it's not in really the um, you know the scientists they they don't necessarily follow this, but the but coaches, but a lot of coaches believe that we if we should do active recovery between the work intervals because it clears the nauseous blood lactate of course that's false but that's the prevailing if we look at the the majority of the coaching population even the athlete beliefs that's what they they think so you got to got to keep moving and stuff and i think that's i think 50 watts or or you know an easy walk is is probably yeah. all you need and and but that uh, was what i thought that they had between the series but in the breaks so i thought that actually when i read the paper the first time i thought that they had 30 seconds on with the high power and then 15 seconds complete rest and then and so on and then the where they describe it as 50 percent of their uh, incremental power output i thought that that was the five minutes between the repeated series hmm. and, and that made sense to me but then i asked him and he said oh no no but that is also what they practice because he was afraid that it wouldn't create a high enough uh, oxygen uptake in total. Hmm. So. Lots of ways to skin the cat again. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. But, and I also but, think uh, it was just that when when I then start working with this, and I, I, I then I thought that uh, okay, these athletes they can actually achieve uh, almost maximal or in the target area of ninety five percent of of peak heart rate with complete rest uh, and very short uh, exercise period. So. Yeah, totally. Well, again, the yeah, the most important thing in in if you're doing a hit session, it's the high intensity um, part of it that should be the most important to get the stimulus. So that at least that's what I believe. And yeah. let's let's go now, Lars. Let's just show um, that example, just in the interest of time. Let's move through and show um, uh, some examples of uh, of high intensity continuous, long interval continuous, and short intervals in a, in a, in an elite. Uh, this is an elite triathlete. So this is um, this is Andy Busher, who I used to coach. He's now retired, but um, we can just kind of look. We're going to look at three different examples and just kind of compare them for the for the viewer and the listener. Um, and in this in this example here, Andy is really he's one of the top cyclists. When he was going, he was one of the top cyclists in the triathlon game. And here he was really he always knew that he was really on when he could do th around thirty minutes at four hundred watts. Which is, you know, ma just massive for for many, for us to even kind of contemplate for for many of us. But note the, um, I guess the, just how taxing this is to kind of do, um, you know, so much effort for so long. And yeah. we have this interesting. This is um, we're, we're we're kind of also showing the, um, I guess the the platform that myself and my colleagues have been developing called Athletica. And we have a new um, we have a new feature on that, a new algorithm called the workout reserve. And it's the green line in here. So you can notice and it's kind of on a scale of 100 to zero. Think of it at first like a battery and it's based on your last six weeks of data. So it doesn't matter who you are, you're going to have a workout reserve if you upload your um, your Garmin or your Strava data. You'll see what you've done in the last six weeks and everything is needs to be individualized and relative to you and what you've done. So we can see in this example, clearly Andy has gone deep and he hasn't by the by about, you know, maybe uh, 15 minutes or so into this 30 minute effort. He's way down here um, in this 400 meter effort. And notice that his power actually drops and comes off. Heart rate drifts. Up, up here as well. So 
this is he is very very exhausted after this and this is just one of a number of different attempts that he was we were trying to see if he could do because he knew when he was on that that he he would often win um uh, an iron man or a 70.3 kind of event yeah. so it was part of just one sort of training session on it he's doing that up a hill so that's a one, continuous one would claim session. that it, it would be fair to be fatigued if you do uh, 30 minutes <laughs> at approximately 400 watts but that's that's fine uh, of course. So, but course. but this uh, you are uh, this because I found that your workout uh, reserve uh, quite interesting when I saw your slides here. Uh, so that's quite of an algorithm where you try to calculate how close are you to your power duration curve, your maximal uh, power duration curve. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So it leverages um, the concept of maximal mean powers or maximal mean paces in the con in the context of runners. So um, yeah, so if you if you are familiar with maximal mean powers, right? These are little taking little bits. It doesn't matter the duration of interest. It's it's taking all of them and it's looking at the uh, average power in all of those different durations. So you could have a okay. you know a very long maximal mean power of you know for one hour. What's your one hour maximal mean power? Conversely, you could have a five second maximal mean power. It doesn't matter. It's always looking in the um, at whatever. Um, you are doing in that um, power time range relative to what you've done in the past. Okay. What's do even you, cooler? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Do, do you also use it when you, so to say, coach your athletes? Because, I mean, I have stopped this. I, of course, use the different zones to have an idea of where are we in intensity domains. But I actually used to say, if you're just below your power duration curve or below or to the left or how you define it, then you're good. Because I mean, let's say that you go very high intensity, but if you only do it for half of the time that you can sustain that, then it might still not be a maximal. I mean, as soon as you go into what Stephen would call zone four or five, then you could say, then it's dependent on for how long time are you there? So, so That's just right. like in 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 strength training, you have this: you lift weight, and you you use the term repetition in reserve. Likewise, here you could say, okay, you can go for this effort. You can go. Let's say this athlete here goes for four hundred watts, but you only ask him to do it for let's say four minutes. Then, of course, you would be where you still have a large workout reserve. Do do you use that in order to so to say to say you should go at this intensity, but you should have let's say some kind of, of reserve uh, and in, in that way define the, uh, the, 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 the duration of the effort or the intensity of it. Absolutely, we do. And it really kind of comes back to Steven Seiler's whole concept of going away from the no pain, no gain uh, philosophy. You shouldn't be dipping too much. We shouldn't be doing this too much. Like, look at how, look at Andy is hanging out in, at around zero. That's and like you said, uh, Lars, he is going to be fatigued after doing that. Absolutely, he is. There is a potential context, uh, context where he's conditioned to that, and maybe workout reserve after a while is is only up in here, and it's not as hard on him um, because of of you know continuous adaptations and whatnot to training. Yeah. So the. I mean, yes, is to your no, answer. No, no, but this would be a competition. So let's say he was going to do a time trial, which was be uh, 20, 30 kilometers. This would be the effort. Then the Correct. idea is, of course, how can you mix it up in training uh, also when he's not completely fresh? Uh, exactly. So let's let's move to that question and let's answer it on the next slide. Um, and let's look at one of some, so this is, uh, this came down to a, a win that Andy had and um, he was mixing up. He wanted to still have some long intervals in there. So let's look at this cascade of different long intervals that Andy had in this. Uh, actually kind of, it's a mix of short and long because he starts with, you know, as we can see here, five by one minutes. And, um, you know, here's the, you know, the, the power outputs. He's almost really warm up ones because you'll, you'll see in the next slide, he can do much more than that. Um, yeah. And then, you know, then he does a, a series of three by five minutes. Um, actually, he was going to do, he was trying to do three by, or five by five. And here's, and let's have a look at what happens when he's doing the, the five by five minutes. So here's the power. It looks like he's holding, again, around just over 400 watts. 
over 400 watts for two, over 400 watts. Looks like it's about, you know, he's got about a minute or so recovery in between. And then look at the last one. He just, you know, he, the actually even the third one, you can see he kind of comes down a bit, heart rate spiking. And then this one, he, he gets, you know, a minute into it and he's like, no, that's not happening. But look at, you know, look at workout reserve down in here. It's going below zero, the green line. So he doesn't have, that's, that, that says, remember, he doesn't have the history. He doesn't have the background to be able to do that because it's always looking at the last six weeks of your, of your um, maximal mean powers. So um, yeah, he, he needs either more recovery um, which would which would change that change the value, yeah. um, or he needs to back off on the power a little bit. But so it's quite a quite a little powerful instrument. Um, anyways, actually, just... I think that these two examples here they also pinpoint because the one minute's effort, his heart rate doesn't get up into the one sixty areas where he had half an hour in the other one. So they are so to say too short if they are standing alone. The yeah. five minutes effort. They are hard to do because I mean he's on he's at the limit and they they will still uh, I mean also in the initial uh, phase you will create an oxygen deficit so he might exhaust it so it's actually difficult for the longer intervals to get uh, the same amount of of volume that he he had in the other uh, type of session so it might I be agree. as demanding for him uh, both in terms of recovery but also in in terms of to, to do 400 watts, even if it's broken down into five minutes uh, intervals. I agree. I agree. Which is why my bias now, based on the science, is to go shorter to get more bang for buck. To uh, yeah, to steal. Yeah, for that um, type of for that type of effort. Whereas it's clear that when you go to the three times ten, where you also go at a lower power output, then 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 he's good. Yeah, in totally. No problem. Well, this is his bread and butter, right? This is what yeah. he does. He's a he's a diesel engine, and yeah, he's doing the, the three by tens, and and no no problem there, really. And they're below, th yeah, they're kind of below his threshold or at his. But threshold. I guess still in a in an intensity domain that would be relevant for an Ironman, because I mean, if this yeah. was preparation for that. Totally, yeah, Ironman or a, or a seventy point three for sure. Yeah. So. Yeah, and again, workout re only to the end is workout reserve depleted there um, at, at that effort. But let's finish off here on the examples, Lars, and let's go to the, the one that's really focused on here today, and that's the short interval. So this is, again, this is still Andy, but notice this is now 3015 sessions, um, and this is four by seven 3015s. And um, he's doing uh, these at 600 watts, very high for that that um, that 30 30 second bout. Um, but I guess notice notice workout reserve how it's always relatively preserved. It is you know very, for those short durations, it does hit zero by the ends of them. Um, but it's nice big recoveries between them, and um, yeah, I guess you can you can see heart heart rate gets up to still gets up pretty high, um, you know, in, into the 160s for, for a period of time in there. And again, look at the, the engagement of the fast switch muscle fibers has to be by default much greater in, yeah. in this type of, a, of an effort. To, I mean, 600 watts, man, like that's, that's, you know, or close to at least 550, right? Like he's, he was targeting 600, but yeah, he like, I'm just looking at the scale. He's kind of, he's doing just over 500. Let's be honest. But when I saw that one, it looked to me that as if he was keeping like 300 in the break period, or is, or is that because it doesn't just drop enough? Because if I look at the blue there. Yeah, I think it just doesn't drop enough because uh, he knows to go easy in those ones. I think it just, okay. Yeah, I just don't think the resolution is no, is, no. Because is, I mean, for enough. practical purposes, we started doing these on you know the old-fashioned uh, um, uh, wind gate ergometers where you can drop the the weight on and then lift it up, and so then you can get complete rest. But you still need to spin up the wheel. But outdoors, of course, if you have to do a little acceleration, then in practice you may get some power output in in the brakes. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's a good it's a good point, Lars. I mean. I think I mean I know Andy knows how to do this. I just I just think 15 seconds is probably not a great enough resolution to potentially sort of see that that no big, no fast but it could also off. still makes make sense for a triathlete that we would consider not being that explosive 
and maybe not needing that big of a difference because his efforts. Now, I saw that this was preparation for Lanzarote Ironman. Was that correct? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Because there you will hit some nasty climbs, so it will be relevant <laughs> to have. No, no, but you could say if you go on a, a particular flat, then in the Ironman, it may be one of the most equally paced. But I mean, in yeah. cycling, for example, it's not a continuous sport. I mean, it's it's an interval sport. So, of it course, is. you could also have the stimuli there. But it could make more sense to have it more equalized out to say not to go 800 watts in the in, in the exercise periods uh, yeah but absolutely absolutely yeah. no it's uh it, it's a a heck of a course the but i guess that when you interpret these it would be a way that you could i mean 600 watts if he was going to do that in a continuous effort he would be exhausted in what two two and a half minutes uh oh yeah yeah probably all of that for sure if he was yeah. doing 600 Whereas watts here you can get a lot of accumulated exercise time in that domain I agree. And that is the, uh, you know, the clear advantage of having high intensity uh, work in your session. Granted, yeah. you can get too much of a good thing. You shouldn't do it all the time. We need the, we need the balance or the polarization. I think that's well established now, but you know, uh, again, getting this in your diet as an athlete is very important, has great, great advantages. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, absolutely. And now you say this, getting it in your diet to get used to it. So do you use this? Because that is one of the things that also has been discussed. Oh, this should just be something that you do in your peaking periods. Or do you also prescribe it to your athletes in, you could say, the off season? Yes, uh, also prescribe it. And again, this comes right back to the platform Athletica is that it gets prescribed even in the... Um, uh, even in the off, off season. And I think the the rationale, I believe it was uh, Ben Rolstad showed it. Uh, I can't remember the exact author, but it was, he, he basically showed that when you even, you still got one session of hit high intensity interval training in a week in the off season, you basically, you maintained or um, your fitness levels ultimately across your power profile. And you were able to, um, you were able to, you know, take off uh, at a higher level um, when you resumed back into the regular training. So not a lot, um, but just one little hit. And this is a, a great example. You know, you could just do two or three, three sets of a short interval work like this. And it just tells the body that, no, we don't want to turn off those adaptations just, and, and they're no, not no. that taxing. So but it also makes sense to me that if you, you go, let's say you had a, and in the off season, you go only continuous intervals or long intervals or no intervals, just mileage, you wouldn't get the stimuli of these fibers. So Correct. you could say in order to keep these fibers, their adapting potential, but also just biomechanical uh, uh, properties, then it would make sense to have some of it and have that uh as a, also in the preparational phase uh, yeah so absolutely yeah, yeah. but of so, course you so, can then intensify it uh, yeah later on. yeah and i just want to i want to give a little bit more um you know support for what we're saying here lars and and i guess this i, I moved to this this article here by nikki almquist uh in in bent's uh ronstead's uh lab where he showed that um, he, he, he compared short and, and long intervals in elite cyclists and, and the, the, you know, definitely to me sh showed evidence, basically, you know, showed a lot of evidence for that, um, the short interval group, um, you know, it's a group, not, a, not as great with it because it wasn't repeated measures, I guess, but two, two different groups and the short interv interval group definitely showing, um, uh, this enhanced, uh, you know, power or across the power profile, um, backing a, a few of the things that Lars and I have, have talked about today, where you can still achieve a, a, a really high time at VO2 max, you engage your fast twitch muscle fiber units, and that's less fatiguing ultimately as well, because you're giving your, your um, you know, you're leveraging that myoglobin principle. And um, remember that has a fallback effect into your central nervous system. And you can, you know, that it's not as taxing. You don't feel as exhausted. The workout reserve is less, all these various different things. And um, it's, it just seems to be a more manageable 
and sustainable practice, uh, short versus long. I, I, it's not to say that long doesn't have its place. I think it's a great specific prep um, preparation. It's shown that repeatedly, but you know, Nikki and colleagues are sort of showing here that you know it's uh, you might get a little more bang for buck you know, using short over long yeah. uh, for long term. No, but I also think that something that people misinterpret uh, from this is that when you go short intervals, <clears throat> that you don't have enough volume <clears throat> because I mean, if you, it's clear that if you do short intervals and you go let's say all out so you then you will only complete like five or six if, if you go uh let's say it's 30 15 or 40 20 or whatever uh, but if you go them as maximal so you go the first one all out and then the second one of course you will drop because you don't have adequate recovery but you still go all out then you will exhaust yourself in six or seven and you won't get the sufficient volume but if you yeah. if you pace yourself so that you can sustain the effort over longer then you can get a, a quite large volume for this type. Yeah, uh, that's right. And many Absolutely. of the people where I hear them say going bents, I hate them. That's because they do them all out from the beginning. That's uh, right. Yeah, it's quite funny. Yeah. Nikki is actually in our lab now uh, as a postdoc. Oh. Uh, so small world. Uh, but just Absolutely. also to explain this, this is of course the Wingate, the V Max, and so on. That's the different test that they do. So they That's do right. a maximal wind gate, a VMAX, uh, four, five minute, four minutes all out uh, power. Uh, yeah, for and sure. Post. And then, then yeah. present, presented in a similar, um, yeah. you know, means like we would expect for a power profile. Yeah. But yeah. it still makes sense that there's a transfer effect. So if you improve in the intense domain, then you improve the entire. Absolutely. The, yeah. You improve the entire, entire profile, which is quite yeah. remarkable. Um, and maybe just one last slide, if I if I could, uh, Lars, and that's this just just came out. So this is pretty interesting data in professional cyclists from James Sprague and colleagues. And the the paper is titled that the intensity, you know, um, rather than the amount of work is the main variable that shifts the power down in professional cyclists. And this yeah. is. You know, it's quite interesting. And it's, he's looking at he, he, the, the, what the guys basically did was they did, they looked at a power profile uh, series of tests fresh. They did um, low intensity, you know, with a, you know, a same amount of work. And then they did a high intensity session. I think it was, it was something like, something like eight by five minutes. Right. Yeah. That's and correct. yeah, you know, you, you know, the paper. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I just read it because we also have an interest in the durability area. So, yeah. Exactly right, but what is fascinating here, I guess, they, they, and they kind of identified, you know, these fatigue resistant guys, these uh, semi fatigue resistant guys, and then the fatigue sensitive guys. But ultimately, you're looking at um, what's consistent is is that the high intensity group, when you're doing high intensity um, in the before, it's going to shift down. Ultimately, the workout reserve, right? You think in, in this, imagine back to the high intensity group, their workout reserve is going to be down in the floor. They're going to be down around zero and they're not going to have, they're not going to be able to kick it up for high intensity stuff thereafter. So that intensity um, factor that we've sort of been talking about today, that you're going to get a lot more in long intervals versus short is a real killer, right? It's something that coaches have known forever. Coaches always say speed kills, right? And they've known this for 50, 75 years. They've told us that. Yeah. And, you know, the, our data now is kind of supporting that. So you really, you're, with when you're looking at intensity across duration, you're playing with fire a bit, uh, um, scientists and coaches. So just kind of, the, all the data is sort of pointing there. So be really, uh, I don't know, patient and careful with your prescription of that intensity too too long because remember that consistency of training is the key variable that's going to you know back and, and enhance your your development right and again nikki's data the last slide sort of really yeah, yeah and i agree with the last point that of course it shouldn't be on the on the if you compromise consistency because you go too hard in these types of sessions but i mean i think that when you get used to it on that perspective, now we have basically, and we often work with this in cyclists because you can measure power output and you can get it nice and decent and so on. 
Do you see some kind of uh, trade-off if we go to, for example, giving running? Because if you do it in running <clears throat> and you get very high speed in the in the in the short periods, then you also get a very massive uh, eccentric component. Do you see a risk there of uh, compromising recovery, increased risk of uh, of injuries, and so on? Absolutely, That's and yeah, you've you've really. So all pretty much we've spoke the whole podcast um, presentation here about the cyclist. And now you're bringing in running, running, just like you said, has that eccentric component, you know, a jarring force of, uh, you know, into the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments, the joints. And we call this a neuromuscular, musculoskeletal uh, stress or strain. And um that's definitely has a big, a big impact, right? So if you're a running coach or scientist listening to this, you've got an absolutely new variable that you need to consider. And again, um, it, it can be conditioned. So I, I've, I, I give this story sometimes most, most, you know, uh, about this. Uh, I was giving this presentation on hit training to coaches in the New Zealand Olympic program and uh, John Walker's coach was there. John Walker won, I think it was uh, maybe the 70, I forget which Olympics, maybe it was Montreal, 76. But regardless, he's there and he's saying, oh, I applied uh, HIT training just about every day to John Walker. So John has developed his system to be able to, and his you know neuromuscular system to be able to adapt to that. So it's not to say you can't do it, but it takes a long time to develop the, I guess, resiliency to be able to kind of, handle that and um and probably a very careful coach so you've got to be a little more careful i would just sort of say yeah. lars with the with the running context thank you for bringing that up yeah no no but it's also because i mean you could take untrained people and you can increase their volume and so on in cycling uh, quite fast whereas in running it's another story but i think that at least in uh, i also think that in in rowing did you work with some of the new zealand rowers when you were over there because i think in rowing because your effort is perceived above your uh, aerobic uh, uh, maximal power, there could be a really big uh, gain because you can get much specificity uh, in that. And of course, yeah. also for, for, for the types of runners, if you are a 1500 meters runner, 800, you should be able to do this. It was more if you, let's say you're a marathon runner and you started doing too much of this uh, there might be a trade-off. On the other hand, I still think that I would prefer it also for a runner to do these repeated short intervals rather than you could say thousand meter intervals. Again, I think that the eccentric load there also would be quite high uh, yeah, when they, they do this type. And another way in running to mix it up now that we are in that business could also be to change on what surface are you running? Are you running uphill and so on? And of course, runners also do that. So you, you just should probably think of another way of mixing it up absolutely yeah running in the sand running in the grass yeah um, water running i mean there's like so many different degrees and ways you can manipulate the neuromuscular stimulus remember yeah. we, you can do that a bit in cycling as well by curbing the cadence so you can get the the your rpms a lot, a lot lower um yeah. at moderate power outputs so you can do what's called a you know a, a strength endurance training workout right so um yeah, and and so there's lots of different ways to manipulate the neuromuscular stimulus, which is yeah again another another lever that you can pull as a coach. Um, but I mean that that's is, why I'm a cyclist. You can shift gears much easier than when you're running. It's difficult to shift gears. So. Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Great. I think we've been uh, around a lot of uh, different uh, things, both in terms of mechanistic and how you mix it up and see things. So uh, I think it's been uh, quite interesting. I will, as uh, I promised, uh, try to share some of these uh, links. If there are also some links that you would like uh, to share, you're welcome to to add those uh, so that people can find the, the different uh, papers that we have uh, touched upon here. And maybe also a link to your uh, your homepage so they can find uh, your your platform and maybe get uh, inspired or utilize it. Is it open? Do you use it for others? Is it just something you use for analyzing for your athletes, this Athletica platform? Yeah, it's a full commercial operation. Um, we run studies on it as well. I know there'll be a... Um, you know, there'll be a good um, 
group of uh, academic and uh, coaches that listen to your to your uh, your podcast and presentation, Lars. So yeah, it's um, so Athletica is a platform that caters to runners, uh, cyclists, triathletes, do athletes, and now row now rowers. Um, and not just the athletes, it's not just an AI coach for athletes that want to self-coach, but it's also a coaching platform as well. So coaches can come in and get the help of the leverage of our AI tools to have their, um, have their sessions automated and produced for them. Um, they can, they're all fully customizable, um, but all of the tools that you've sort of seen here, including Workout Reserve, Workout Wizard is another one we haven't even talked about, manipulates and changes the, the training based on the context. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, yeah, go to athletica.ai to, yeah. to check, check that out. But as I said, I will, um, in, the, in the comments, I will link to these so people can find them. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lars. Yeah, great. Thank you very much for uh, taking your time here and uh, getting up early in Canada. There's a time <laughs> difference here, so uh, that's great. And you're in the gym, so uh, that's also <laughs> advocating for good practice knowledge. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Lars.